<laughs> you made me think about things um, that I've not put in that context before as well with different languages, Olga. So you're like, you're right. Um, just you can become a different person when you're speaking a different language. You, it's just it's how it works sometimes. Yeah. Now I'm yeah. going to like psychoanalyze myself you when I'm speaking <laughs> Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, welcome to another episode of Relocation Leader. Today we're talking about cross-cultural communication and we have Olga Collin from IOR with us today. Olga, do you want to introduce yourself and what you do for IOR? And yeah, thank you, Zach. It's very nice to be here. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Olga Collin and I am a senior advisor of the intercultural team uh, teams at uh, IOR Global Services. So uh, in my capacity as a senior advisor, I manage our trainer network. We have more than 250 people around the globe. So I make sure they are onboarded. They have the experience required by our uh, clients and our uh, assignees to deliver cross-cultural trainings. I also uh, participate on the client calls, designing and customizing the materials to make sure that we meet the needs of our clients. Uh, I've been with IOR for the last four years in this particular capacity, but I've been associated with the company for more than 16 years, being a cross-cultural trainer and coach for, for them and delivering a variety of different products, starting from cross-cultural training to repatriation program, working with adults, working with uh, youth, with the groups, and doing assessment trainings as well. Nice. Exactly. Yep. And also with me, uh, we have Molly Vankic, Um, and she's our Senior Vice President of uh, International Services at NEI Global Relocation. Molly, did you want to introduce yourself and your role? Yeah, absolutely. So my responsibility here at NEI is I oversee the International Services area, which includes managing our offices in Singapore, in Geneva, Switzerland, and what we consider the Americas team here in the U.S., which would manage inbound, outbound moves to America. Um, to the United States and within the Americas, and really focusing on those uh, account executives who work with all these relocating employees going to different countries around the world. Around the world. So, like I said, today we're talking about uh, cross-cultural communication, and uh, I thought we'd just start off by just what is that? So, Olga, can you kind of just get us up to speed on what is cross-cultural communication? You know, why does it matter? And do you have any funny stories? It's a very loaded question, Zach, to start with. Cross-cultural <laughs> communication <laughs> can be defined as any communication between two people. We very mm -hmm. often assume that cross-culture involves national cultures. However, it can be a, a communication between uh, the employees of two different genders or two different, uh, uh, within the two different business units within the same company. Uh, it can be different generations talking to each other. It can be a parent talking to a child. It can be just two friends talking. All of those communications, in essence, are cross-cultural because we all have our own cultures, which has, again, uh, uh, many, many particular layers with national cultures be just, being just one of the uh, one of the layers. Um, so in terms of the personal experiences, like, this is a interesting question. Um, I get that question quite a lot, and especially when people start complimenting me on my um, English lang language skills, not realizing that I've actually lived in the United States for 20 years, and <laughs> that the accent is there by design. <laughs> But, but um, I often find myself answering this question saying that um, even though I may be speaking with an accent, but I don't necessarily think with an accent, what leads to miscommunication between me and you, for example, can be just a different understanding of cultural concepts and how we were brought up within our own cultural environment and the experiences that we had in life. And also that we tend to absorb different personalities based on the cultural experience based on the languages that we speak. Uh, for example, in English, I tend to be an extrovert. I tend to be outgoing. I tend to be uh, uh, very engaging. I rely on sense of humor a lot. Whereas when I'm speaking Ukrainian, I'm a completely different person. Yeah, So it would not necessarily 
associate me with the personality that you currently see on screen. I'm an introvert, you know, so I'm a bit more reserved. I rely more on observing the environment before jumping in. I do take time to get to know another person. And that all of that is part of the cross-cultural communication too. Wow. That's, that's a really good answer. Good yeah. word. Oh my God. I feel like I'm rambling. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. You made me think about things, um, that I've not put in that context before as well with different languages, Olga. So you're like, you're right. Um, just, you can become a different person when you're speaking a different language. You, it's just, it's how it works sometimes. Yeah. Now I'm yeah. going to like psychoanalyze myself you when I'm speaking Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. But I think it gives us really, like, it's like traveling without leaving your own desk, you know, or even your yeah. own personality uh, so, or your own body, rather. Um, so you, you become somebody else and it's like a new adventure. And there is also a safety in that because you know, ha, huh, okay, when I revert back to my preferences or when I revert back to Ukrainian, then this is, you know, this self. Yeah. So, but when I speak uh -huh. English, this is that self. And I, it's like you're an actor on stage. You get to relieve both experiences and you can reconcile both of them, use, you know, so certain elements from both styles and just combine them again, creating the third culture. So Olga, I'm curious, how long have you, how long have you been in the States? Uh, I've been in the States for about uh, actually 20 years, and okay. uh, I've been in a cross-cultural field for uh, more than that. So I started when I still um, uh, was getting my master's degree in translation and cultural studies in Germany. I spent some time in the UK. I lived in Italy. I started working with professional expats and people working with global teams when I was still living in Europe. And then uh -huh. when I moved to the United States, specifically to the Chicago area, I basically continued in the same field, working in various capacities, being a um, cross-cultural trainer, uh, coach, I do assessment trainings, I do repatriation programs as well, and um, I was lucky enough to be able to travel uh, to different parts of the United States and to experience regional differences, uh, so both to cultures mm -hmm. and to communication patterns, uh, but I've been mostly based in, in the Chicago suburb. And this is where IOI is based as well. Well, I think you were reading my mind because I was just going to ask you about, have you lived anywhere else in the U.S.? But you said the regional differences, because it is, it's very different. Um, if you've been in Chicago, but even going to the South or West Coast, you're going to see differences or smaller cities as well. Absolutely. Just the level of politeness going to the South, for example, is very different okay. from the level of politeness and the titles and how people address each other going you know, up North or so Northeast in <laughs> New York or Boston. Yeah, so the Midwest is known for the Midwestern nice, yeah, so which uh -huh. many people come I into the Chicago area don't know how to interpret because on the surface people come across as being nice. On the other hand, you still cannot read their minds and they don't return your calls or they say just let's meet together for dinner and that dinner never happens. Uh, so it may be right. confusing. And then if you talk about the Western coast, that's a completely different culture there altogether. Great. Yeah. <laughs> I'm nodding. I'm nodding a lot uh, because then you, you know, take that just within the United States and then you throw that outside of our own borders. Uh, I find it exciting. Uh, a lot of um, new things. It's just something new to experience every time. And the other thing, too, I mean, like, I, I have to imagine the shared history, um, you know, makes uh, or contributes to some of that uh, creation of either a high context or low context culture. Because when you get the map out and you start looking at, okay, where are all the high context cultures? They seem to have a very long history of a of that culture being established and ingrained. And, you know, America was a conglomeration of a lot of, a lot of different cultures. cultures. And um, I feel like you have to adopt a more, um, you know, direct or, um, you know, uh, low context type environment in order to communicate with one another in an effective way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Again, I think that's what's so intriguing of if you have the opportunity to live somewhere, go on assignment or even move there. When you spend some years in a country and really take that effort to understand the culture, learn the language, that's where the richness comes back and understanding how, I guess, how unique different cultures can be, how history plays a part in it, because it's just, it keeps building on itself over the years. And um, again, it's so intriguing for me to, to it, have experienced it, it personally, to be working in it every day. Um, you know, I would be the biggest advocate say, yes, go, go on assignment, move somewhere else. 
just live it yeah, out. I, I couldn't agree more with that. And and we typically do involve, you know, historical facts and look at the historical backgrounds of how the values came to be, why Chinese are more relationship oriented and why are they uh, why do they care so much about saving face and harmony? The same goes for Japan or South Korea. Yeah, so on the other hand, why Scandinavian cultures are so set on on that life and work balance and, and uh, uh, you know, Germans, why are they so direct? Um, so or, or why are they more direct than Americans? Um, so the history does, you know, also how we, you know, relate to each other, how we perceive time, how do we take risk? Um, so Americans, again, you know, so just a great example of huge risk takers, because if you think about the immigration history, people came here with little to nothing. Uh, so in the most cases, they had to rely on their own two hands and their own maybe immediate support, but basically on themselves trying to get through, you know, building a new life and the new opportunity here. They had to take risks. They couldn't even calculate the risks because they didn't know that there was no precedent. There was the uncharted territory for them, so to speak. Yeah. Versus many other um cultures around the world, you know, should, who have rich history, they prefer to look back, to analyze, to kind of see precedents and, and the results and the outcomes of the actions that have been taken in the past and then utilizing that moving forward. Yeah, so the planning, of course, in such cultures, as you can imagine, takes a long time. Yeah, so they have to review the documents, they have to review the leases, they have to review the contract, they have to talk to their colleagues who went through similar assignments. Yeah, so they have to collect the information from different sources be before they can tell you, yes, we are ready. Yes, you know, let's go ahead. Yeah. And in the U.S. context, it's polar opposite. Yeah, so I have a rough idea. I have a rough understanding of where we are going. Let's just go and try things out. Yeah. So we'll and then the details the out later, right? Well, yeah, you exactly. Think, we'll you figure, figure the, the details, details out when we go. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. If I need additional resources or additional information, I know where to find you guys. I'll just you know send you a quick email and I'll find it from you. Yeah. But I don't need this overload right from the beginning. I don't need the material sent to me three weeks ahead of the training, which I just had a case. You know, so I'm working with an SNE who is relocating with his family in Sweden. He asked me already, okay, the agenda, the detailed timing, when do we have breaks, what is going to be covered, what topics are involved, you know, so who else is participating, uh, and uh, that's really drastically different, and that person is just trying to manage the ambiguity and the risk, yeah, because again, Swedes are also not known for being the extreme risk takers, not like Americans are. <laughs> Americans are like, just relax, we got smartphones, we'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Send it to me five minutes before, I'll get to it, Yeah. <laughs> It seems like though, all right, I I feel like after hearing you guys say all those things, um, the thought I had was that, you know, understanding the culture really helps you get beneath the surface. So you may still walk away with, you know, an understanding that Dutch people, in generally speaking, are direct and low context, but it can avoid, uh, but learning more about why they're that way helps you avoid saying they're rude, you know? And that would be... Uh, I think a, a big takeaway is like, you know, understanding the culture can help you avoid the negative aspects of, you know, what somebody may consider like a stereotype. And and instead it sort of gets you back to like generalizations and still considering the person, you know. Absolutely. And I think that's where the the services from like IOR would come into play and in helping people if they've not traveled extensively, they're not quite sure, they've not spent a lot of time in a certain culture to get that up front. Cause you're right. Dutch people for some cultures might come across as rude. But if you understand culturally, this is normal for them. This is not rude. I'm in Japan. It might be this very indirect. They never make a decision. Why do they avoid, you know, speaking out? And you understand, ah, cultural, culturally, this is normal. You're entering into the culture. You're the one who will need to be adapting to that. If you get that up front, uh, your experience is going to be a lot, um, I guess, better quicker than when you're reacting to what's going on here. And I heard a story where there was um, a child who had a teacher that was, you know, from uh, another cultural context mm -hmm. and that didn't uh, really give positive praise, you know. And so when uh, she would send report cards home, they were always, you know, kind of critical, very, very little 
positivity. Yeah. And the mother was like freaking out. You know, she was like, oh, what's wrong? You know, something's going wrong. And the boy was perfectly fine. I mean, he wasn't phased by any of it. And every time the boy would get like a remark that says good job or like something very minimal, he would be elated, you know, and again, not phased by the negative comments and elated by the very minimal uh, you know, positive comment. And the mother was just like, I, d I don't understand this, you know? And I thought it was just such a, a unique uh, story about just in this inside of a family and the goings on of that family, you know, you have all of these things on display. Well, and I think that's what's interesting because we're talking about like country culture. Olga, you mentioned that you've got corporate culture, then you have the individual culture within families, multicultural. I mean, you can it just never really stops once you get going this generational culture, the young versus the old. Um, it's so much to, they say, unpack each time. Um, so I put it down to the individual self on being open and wanting to have that curiosity about what's different about all of us. And when you understand the differences, you can celebrate the differences. And um, again, I just think it makes for a richer experience when we're moving around the world. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Yeah, just maintaining the open mind, the flexibility, the curiosity to ask questions. Um, also, just remembering that by setting some time aside to learn about certain traits or certain preferences, <laughs> it's not a wasted time because <laughs> in the end, your communication will enhance this and, and you will be uh, able to get through your mandatory tasks much quicker and more effectively. So it may seem like a little bit of a time investment at the beginning, but it yields really great you know, results down the road. And that goes for all the differences, really, just trying to understand them, trying to move away from stereotypes, like, like you were saying, to generalizations. Mm -hmm. Yes, you may observe certain traits more strongly in certain cultures, but then again, remember, that's just one aspect of a personality that the person in front of you has. And um, stereotypes typically tend to be uh, you know, negative. We do use them as a mental map to start, but generalizations obviously is what what gets us um, to be more successful and more effective communicators so i'm i'm going to nerd out a little bit here um have you ever <laughs> seen the movie uh last samurai or the last samurai yes. with tom cruise <laughs> yes okay. I have. so that's like one of my favorite movies for those who haven't seen the movie uh the last samurai is about uh a character played by tom cruise who in 1870 japan um was sort of brought in as an expert for military guidance to a modernizing Japan. Mm -hmm. And um, he ends up getting captured by these samurais. And um, then not knowing anything about the culture, he sort of uh, gets to learn about the samurai culture and is totally won over and ends up fighting along their side, side um, you know, against uh, the emperor's army. And, and then because of the valiance, he sort of wins over the empire. Uh, the emperor and so like the movie is just i i think it's one of the best movies ever <laughs> you know but i'm fascinated by the fact that you know him being from that uh low context culture is dropped into a high context culture and he has no knowledge of the relate of the language you know which after i thought about it i'm like you know that's actually not that bad of a thing when uh if you have no knowledge of the language but you're dropped into a, a high context culture where things like traditions and practices and, you know, verbal cues, you know, he's able to sort of observe all these um, uh, nuances of the, of the culture before he actually learns the language so that by the time he um, knows how to talk to everyone, he's already integrated into that culture. And then sort of like, as he sort of moves from, not being open to the culture, to being more open to it, um, those practices uh, that, you know, the traditional samurai, um, you know, they, it's part of their culture. It starts to start to heal his character. And so I, I just think it's phenomenal. And it's a great example of um, how cross-cultural uh, cross communication, um, you know, works in reality, you know. 
Yeah, and, and to use that example, actually, I mean, he is a perfect, or Tom Cruise's character there is a perfect uh, example of how two cultures got combined and merged into a third culture, which he has become because his sense of loyalty, the, the, the sense of honor, yeah, so he certainly maintained that he just enhanced it with some of the traditional Japanese culture that feed that into some of the characteristics that he already had, maybe not exhibited, but certainly had. Uh, and, and to your point, Zach, as well, uh, sometimes, I mean, the language obviously is a huge part of communication, but being able to observe the nonverbal clues, being emerged in the culture uh, and, and uh, just, just developing your own sense of, of uh, what it is that the world means to people here. Yeah, so I think that's really important and it's a backdrop of the language skills then in, in the case of this hero came came a little bit little bit later. And that's also to support the point that neither side is better or worse. Neither preference is right or wrong. It's just the preference. And in our daily lives, we fluctuate between those uh, um, uh, uh, what are the tendencies and, and preferences you know, from 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 morning till evening, yeah. So just think about yourselves when you are in a work environment. You know, so you may be more task driven and more explicit and more low context than when you deal with clients who maybe are in Japan or maybe in the UK. Yeah, so you tend to shift your gear and uh, uh, be a bit more, you know, uh, observant of the environment of the nonverbal clues that the client is sending you. You know, just setting the stage and reading between the lines a bit more. Then when you talk to your husband back home and he's from Austria, maybe you're switching back to a bit more of a direct communication style. And then you're talking to the kids and you're switching your style yet again. So it's all really about the sense of awareness and understanding that we are absolutely capable and are doing actively this style switching and the code switching going through our day-to-day activities and it's not a separate skill that we have to acquire we just have to be aware of that skill and we have to utilize it you know intentionally so when you're coaching people up um who maybe are they have no experience moving into another culture how how do you uh sort of coach them to be able to read the room to understand or to to learn about the culture that they're coming into and interact in it in a way that uh, helps them uh, survive, you know, or helps them, you know, strive uh, uh, towards, a, you know, success in whatever uh, venture they have in that new culture. Uh, well, as we determined, you know, all of us are fortunate enough to work in the field that that we love, which is the cross cultural communication, and that all starts really with understanding culture, defining culture. Uh, then really thinking about the self-awareness. There are various assessment tools that we typically use to kind of map out uh, uh, participants and and, um, employees' personal preferences. We use that as a starting point, and then we do compare it with the destination culture or the culture of the colleagues that they work with on a regular basis to kind of map out where the differences are. And uh, then through case studies, through observations, through... um, examples that participants bring to the table in regards to communication or hierarchy or time perception, Uh, then we start working on strategies. It's like, okay, so we have the situation with, you know, a consultant coming from Brazil and, and, um, uh, um, you know, trying to meet with us. Uh, So how can that situation be a learning experience? What could have been done differently? And how can we bridge the gap between in this case, low context communication and high context communication. So the last question I'm going to ask him, do you have any questions for me? I guess the one question I had, which is not really related to cross-cultural communication, is how did you come up with that example about the uh, the samurai movie? <laughs> it's, you know what? Movies are a big part of my life. <laughs> no, I just, I don't know. Like, so uh, that movie was really impactful to me. My favorite part is at the end. Uh, so uh, when... Um, Kazumoto was dying. You know, he the last thing he says to Tom Cruise's character was, you know, I will miss our conversations. You know, and man, I don't tear up much, but I was dark close there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so I don't know. I just the friendship that developed between those two coming from totally different um, 
you know, insanely different cultures and the healing that took place with Tom Cruise's character by adopting a lot of the samurai practices. I think it was just beautiful. It was a beautiful example of that third culture that you were talking about. Yeah, and I think we should have, you know, um, maybe articulated it a bit more specific that that basically makes us, you know, more uh, complete. Yeah, so more That's versatile, right. more flexible, more accomplished, more, you know, um, successful too. Okay. Yeah, so because yeah. it just gives us all these different points of reference, you know, the, the switching between different communication styles, between different abilities to read between the lines, to understand hierarchy, to communicate in a different way. It's like, you know, having two different apps on the phone, yeah, so and using them interchangeably. Um, so we're still the phone, yeah, we just have all these different apps um, uploaded um, into our, you know, consciousness. Yeah, It goes back to the seeking to understand, mm -hmm. right? And like once we have that, it's just part of our everyday seeking to understand it, then it, it is more fulfilling. I think that success then automatically, automatically, it comes with it because you, I don't know, it's just about the journey. It's about the road that you're on. Mm -hmm. It's that understanding. It, it keeps changing, keeps growing um, every single day. Yeah, yeah. You're just making me think of so many different movies, Zach. And the movie reels go through my head, for. like me, Lawrence of Arabia, yeah, like... Doctor Chicago. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, and it goes on and on. I'm like, these are all great <laughs> things. We need to. Right? Uh, I mean, like when cultures collide, and it's a beautiful collision, right? Yeah. It is. Yeah, it, it yeah. Well, is. Or can be if leveraged correctly, and because Correct. it's all really about awareness, you have to understand, uh, so culture, or at least. Uh, be aware of the fact that it is due to different culture in order not to feel offended by it or not to judge automatically because there, if there is no awareness then we default to what we know and by comparison what we see is a different you know and be threatening or can be threatening you know so it, it's really all about just just as i said awareness cultural trainings any kind of uh, opportunities to learn and to grow our understanding. Um, so all of that is, is super helpful. And in terms of movies, I use movies as an example all the time, explaining the U.S. culture. It's all about Superman, Iron Man, Wonder Woman, like one person. <laughs> See? That's what we are. Oh, you weren't on. Yeah. Train on the money. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going I'm to hop back on the nerd train, though, really quick. Yeah. Um, you know, the the thing that struck me so much uh, in the, the Last Samurai, though, was... Kamamoto's interest in Tom Cruise's character in, you know, Nathan um, preceded Nathan's interest in the samurai culture, you know, like they were both very interested to learn about each other in the end, but it started with one person taking a genuine interest in the other, you know. Yeah. Which is what it is, actually. You're right. Without that interest, it's not going to go anywhere. Yeah. Nice. Well, man, I have really enjoyed this conversation, Olga, and I want to thank you for uh, coming on Relocation Leader with us. Uh, once again, I'm Zach Turbis. This is Molly Vonkik and Olga Collin. And um, yeah, we just want to thank you for, for coming on. Thank you so very much. It's been a tremendous pleasure for me as well. So just keep open minds and, um, and keep learning. <laughs> So that was another episode of Relocation Leader. Make sure if you haven't yet scheduled or set the date for uh, coming to our Talent Agility Symposium at NEI Global Relocation, the dates are September 3rd through October 1st, and we will see you another time. <laughs>